Hi guys, so where I live, um, it's so cold and rainy right now, it's going to snow on the passes and uh, quite a bit, I think. And so I'm not doing much out in the yard right now, and so I've been getting a lot done in this sewing room. We have a standing joke at our house about when something's the messiest it's ever been. The sewing room is the messiest it's ever been. I've got all these new tools and things that I'm playing with and trying to figure out um, what I'm doing and I'm having a lot of fun with it and I'm going to share some of that with you today. We're just going to work our way through a number of points of different things and talk about them as we go. One of the things I figured out pretty quickly after all of my struggles to cut leather using the things I've used in the past, such as a utility knife or an X-Acto or scissors, is that it cuts very well if it's this soft, buttery kind of leather with a rotary cutter. This one came with this leather kit that I bought, and so now it's going to be my designated leather one because a big part of the reason I didn't want to try to use the one I use all the time in the sewing room is that I knew I'd put in a new blade and I didn't want to dull it cutting leather. But I hope you can see that it leaves you with something that is very, very suede not just on the back, but actually slopping over the sides. If you were to sew that onto a piece of quilting, I don't want to have all these suede little flyaways on this edge here. And I don't know if that's something you can see very well. I do have gremlins that come in sometimes and use my stuff. So I am going to write leather only on here. And that'll help me too when I'm in a hurry and starting to make mistakes. The big question is, is the leather you're working with veg tan or chrome tan? And most of the dyed leather, as I understand it at this point in time in the world, is chrome tan. And I think of it kind of as the difference between um, you know, latex paint versus oil-based paint. They have completely different properties and everything you do has to be for that type and there's sort of the same thing going on with leather. So most of the world's leather, 80 to 90 percent, is um, tanned with chromium salts, which is less environmentally friendly than the ages old vegetable tanning, which is easier on the environment and done with tree barks and the like. The leather itself is very different. Soft garment leathers in vibrant colors are likely chrome tan. And then thicker, stampable, dyeable, moldable leathers are probably vegetable tan. There are hybrids, retans, and some lesser used processes as well to confuse things. But for the most part, we're just trying to tell what we're working with. I was hoping for definitive results with these burn tests and I think this one is chrome and these two as well. I can't detect any real green look in that and I think that this is maybe not 100% veg tan but is veg tan. These, I, I'm not sure if they're veg tan or, or if they aren't um, some kind of a re-tan or an over tan or whatever you would call it, a hybrid tan. And so um, I don't feel like my results make me positive what any of these samples are, but I still wanted to show you. This feels like a very personal moment to me because I'm going to show you a bunch of purses that I've loved over the years. Uh, some that I made myself and uh, others that I've just had for 10, 20, even 30 years in one, more than 30 in one case. And so I wanted to show you what I'm trying to accomplish. So this is one of the first things I made when I learned to quilt. It's got the jeans inside. And these are quite frayed. There's stain and paint and everything else, and there's patches in the jeans. And uh, 
I triple wash the jeans when I get them, but anyway, um, that kind of wear and tear for me is acceptable because I think these jeans are still going to last the life of the purse. But the problem with just making quilted straps, I learned because I carried this bag, is that the fabric on the handles is going to wear through. And the rest of this bag, other than being a little dingy from the bottom being set down on the floor at different times, Never in a bathroom. In a bathroom, I hang my bag around my neck like this. Um, a public bathroom. <laughs> if, there's no, if there's no nice hook on the door. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a little wear hole here. There's a few places where it's worn through. But for the most part, this is wearing pretty well. But to me, this is unacceptable. Because it's just, it's too much. And it's all concentrated here. Look how fresh this fabric is down here. So this is a later uh, version of the same type of thing, but with the artichoke instead. And, and so this is mine, and I barely carry it. I, I do when I need to carry a ton of stuff, I'll put this in the mix. And what I want is for the body of the bag, as long as the body of the bag is nice and usable still, I would like the straps to be in good shape, even if the denim lining shows a lot of wear. And that's just my aesthetic, that's just what I'm going for. And you know, it's a real concern, not only do you want your customers to be happy when they take something home, you want them to be happy with it one, two, three, five seven years later. Now with cloth, if they use something every day, it may not make it seven years for them, but they'll have a sense of how much they've used something. And if this fails very quickly, they're not going to be happy. And replacing this, um, I've done it for someone who was actually willing to pay me to replace them, but it's the same thing. I'm sure by now they're all completely worn through. And I don't have one here that I did with leather, but I put leather straps on some of these, and um, I wish I had one myself so I could see how it's wearing. This is one that was just really a test of a particular shape and design, and this purse, I carried it for a while. It's been washed. It's upholstery fabric. Um, if you want to test a purse, take it to Disneyland, your only purse, and stuff it full of everything that you go to the park. We were about three blocks away, and one person had a, a knee brace, and so once we got to the park, we were there all day, and so Mom's bag was overloaded. Even though I, I'd used it for a while before that, it came home like this from Disneyland. And this is why I would like to have certain parts of the bag be leather even though we give up washability. We can still surface scrub. We can treat with Scotchgard or recommend that people treat their bag with Scotchgard. I just brought this because I, I saw it in the closet and decided to bring it. So this is my cash bag. I wear it at the market and shows. Anyhow, I just thought I'd show this. It's got a pocket in the back. Sorry, there's money in here and uh, and my my square and stuff like that but so there's a pocket back here and it's got a thick you know one of the thicker interfacings I've been trying to figure out what I'm trying to do and why and uh, how much is reasonable for me to put into the leather because it's it's gonna raise the price of the bag it's gonna raise the time construction and uh, where's that good price point going to be? I wanted to show you this because this is one of my favorite purses. I got it in college and uh, I wasn't worried about security. <laughs> I didn't have any money or credit cards. <laughs> and, uh, so it was my brush and there were no cell phones and uh, you know my ID and a few other things. But this is so old now that, uh, that everything's coming apart. But at a certain point, it had a strap that was ripped. And you can see how imprecise all of this is. 
and I took it to the shoe repair guy and so you can see he he beveled these and stitched that together and then he did the same in order to mend this for me so that I could I carry it um, for another 10 years was my summer purse my favorite summer purse so this is another one of my very favorite bags I think it was the first leather purse I bought it's a fossil and um, I carried this for years and really loved it and one of the things I wanted to mention about it is that this strap you know I think you could use edge coat that's one of the products I haven't uh, tried yet and you could blacken this up you could even probably just use a black shoe polish and this purse would be pretty close to as good as new and I love that if if this strap failed but the body was still in good shape of course I could um, just replace the strap completely. This is another fossil, completely different. No zipper at the top. It's got a drawstring on it, which is kind of cute. May have inspired some of the drawstrings I was doing, but I was pounding a lot of grommets and rivets, and I wasn't really, they didn't want that to be my job, to be the, a rivet pounder. And uh, this is all kind of nice, but of course you need something that can really sew and these edges are finished on this. But this one's actually turned. This is like a thinner leather than this. They're closely color matched. You know, genuine leather and top grain leather or full leather, uh, all that stuff means something. Back in the day when I was buying purses, you know, when I worked outside of the house and stuff, I, I was looking for just something I thought was real leather. Um, so that it would last and I never realized what part detailing plays in it and this is fascinating to me that this is a turned strap and this thing that I've always considered to just match it is uh, is completely different like this may well be a chrome tan and this one may well be a veg tan and this one uh, has this awesome orange lining and but the thing about this bag, there are two things. One is I really like how this looks with the, the leather just butted up. And those are those edges appear to be sort of lightly treated, finished maybe with uh, paint, edge paint or something. But then on the strap itself, it's to me it's a little less desirable. And it's from age it's getting all cracked up. And the, the edge treatment has enough body that as it falls off there's some serious wear and tear here that I don't think you could just fix like my black fossil where even shoe polish would would make it look practically brand new this paint at this point however old this bag is maybe 15 years old is all cracked all the way everywhere on the bag and and it's coming off and I don't think you could just rub something on there or touch this up I think if you wanted this to look like new you, you might have to figure out how to remove all of that and, and um, replace it and so this as beautiful as this finish was when it was new it's all failing at this point and I just, I just don't think, it's like half as old as that black fossil, and yet it looks older. But it's mainly on these straps. See how this is, is wearing once this coating comes off, and, and it looks like this. I'll show you. It pulls off like rubber at the point where it's not holding on anymore. And so I'm learning that this isn't really the bag for me. Yes. Okay, and then we saw this one before and the only reason I wanted to bring it back out is uh, I, I like this edge. It's a fairly heavy leather. It seems to be finished on both sides. 
So it must be two pieces. I don't know if I can, I don't want to cause, start any damage, but it must be a front and a back piece because I feel like the back is too smooth to be like this if it weren't. And then it's, it's nicely rounded and it, I don't believe this has a rubbery thick coat on it. I think it's just like a red, a red kind of edge coat. And I know that they use waxes and I think some repairs are even done with crayon in order to mix a good color. And yeah, this is, I think, just the nicely finished edge of a good quality leather that's a veg tan and then a bit of paint applied. And so here you can even see the back of the leather. That's the back of that, the way the back of a veg tan looks. So I did about 10 sketches when I started uh, right after I finished the seven purse tops. And I've been working from those. A lot of them have uh, similar styling to some of the cosmetic bags that we've covered on the channel and some of them are a little bit different. Some of them borrow ideas from the leather book I showed. Some of them borrow ideas from uh, my purses that I've loved. And uh, most of the timing, or most of the design time that's going into making these early pieces is spent on what's going on in the interior because I've decided that I want the leather, that inside suede part of the leather, I want a lining covering that, but yet I still want the inside quilting to show. And so, and I want it to all be neat and tidy and precisely done. And so a lot of the time I'm working on is that inside of the bag and what needs to be bound to make it finished because even though I do the raw edge quilting it's not about just leaving the inside of the bag so that the seams have threads pulling off of them forever that tangle with your pen caps and and stuff like that it's the inside of the bag I want to be nicely finished um, I'll show you a couple of those um, so most of the time that I'm working on is dealing with the linings and any stabilizer that I might want the lining to have. I do like them to be stabilized in most cases. Closures, zippers and other closures, any hardware, straps, interior and exterior pockets. And so um, I'm working on all that stuff and as I finish things I'm going to start putting them on Etsy and if people want to look at the details they can see those things on Etsy. I'm also going to add eyeglass cases and sunglass cases uh, as we go forward. This is kind of a little cosmetic bag. I think it would be really cute if it had nice uh, tabs on both sides, sides or maybe just a strap sewn in that was parachute cord. I think this would look really cute, sort of as a crossbody bag that sort of sat it on your hip. Um, and I think it could use a pocket. Future ones I think would probably have a pocket. But what I did was I... And this one doesn't have any hand sewing on it because I, I didn't think about the leather or the covering the leather as an afterthought. I, I did it in the course of making the bag. And I think it's pretty cute. My husband really likes this one. And I asked him, years ago someone said they thought I was gilding the lily and so my husband s says that to me sometimes and I'm like, you don't realize how much that hurts my feelings. Um, I asked him if he thought the beading was extraneous and that it was gilding the lily um, but he said no he likes the beading so one man's gilding is another man's you know that's the best part so who knows anyhow um, 
I've got those things going and I'm trying to figure out linings and I'm working on several other designs. This is my, I don't know if I've ever had this out before, purse hardware. Uh, I don't know what it was I thinking I was going to make a bunch of fanny packs. <laughs> I've got some various... Some of these are solid brass and some of them are uh, cheaper. Some of it's the stuff that you can get at the chain store or used to be able to. It seems to be a reasonable quality. These are solid brass D-rings. These ones are much older from when I was making aprons. But so anyway, uh, I did get a whole bunch of magnets. And these are slightly lesser quality than the ones I was getting. I got a whole bunch. I got a hundred or I don't know if it was, I don't think it was more than a hundred. This is the boot stitcher, the shoe mender, the cobbling machine. And uh, obviously something like this needs a nickname. And so my husband's nicknamed it Stitch from Lilo and Stitch, which uh, Stitch was called the monstrosity by his creator. We plan to hook this <laughs> contraption to take it off the legs and hook it to a table. As an Amazon associate, I earn for qualifying purchases. That will make it be at a good sewing height. So my leather stations are not completely set up, but they're getting there. Bought a little uh, tool stand. There's a little kind of a kitchenette area that I've just decided to use for doing the leather because I don't actually keep food up here and there's no running water. I bring up a water bottle and I, I sometimes have a couple of pops and things in the, in the little refrigerator. So far, most of what I've done, I've been able to do on my own machine. It's just, when I was making the prototypes, it was bringing back for me and I, and I knew it would remind me of, of what I was doing when I sort of started moving away more and more from doing the leather. I would get to one part where I needed to sew two, three, four inches through more than my machines could handle. And I just, and you could walk through some of it, but then what you'd get is this. I, I already reshaped this little bag and it's, I think it's really cute now that the sides are really tight. But before I did that on stitch, I took pictures so that you could see how loose and not good the jeans thread looked along the sides here. I just was not pleased with that. And you know, there's some question in my mind when I'm making the bag that's part leather and but mostly fabric. Do I stitch the fabric with the nylon thread? Do I use a cotton covered polyester and all purpose thread. Um, and I'm sort of working through that, trying to think of on balance what's the best thing for me because you, you want your customers to be happy so they come back and they buy something similar for their friend or their daughter. You also don't want them to come back with a return. And um, I, ha I haven't had very many returns over the years. I think probably I could count them on one hand. And boy, in all cases, except for one, I kind of think I was dealing with someone who probably returned stuff constantly. And, uh, you know, I had a special order once where the woman wanted me to try again because the inside of the bag was boring. And she she did a special order and she she wanted me to capture all the beauty in my booth in a purse for her for two hundred dollars <laughs> and the inside of the bag was boring the woman who bought the purse later um, 
hugged it on the way out and I said, should I put that in a bag, in a sack? And she said, are you kidding? And she left my booth with it clutched to her chest. So that was awesome. But I had to cover up the initials. The woman who had originally ordered the bag wanted me to put her initials on it. And that should have been uh, the tip off to me that I shouldn't have taken that order because she, I believe she felt that um, she was the designer of the bag and where she said you could do this or this or this or this or this or you could do this I took it to be or I, I'll do some of what you're saying and I'll make you something beautiful and I think she took it to mean it has it's a checklist you have to put all these things in there anyway I digress um, you don't want returns you want happy customers I've always had a rule, and it's very hard sometimes to stick with it, but the rule is you never burn a customer. You just don't. You never burn a customer. Even if you think it would be pleasant to say, you know, you're unreasonable, go away, I hate you. You don't ever say that. You say, I'm sorry you're unhappy. I'll refund your money. Um, I don't think having me remake the bag is, is going to be a good process for anyone. I don't think you're going to get something that you like more, and I'm not willing to do it anyway. And then you try not to even say that last line. <laughs> anyway, there were very few of those experiences, but they stick in your mind because they're unpleasant. 